proposed a theory called the theory of critical elections. Uh, you may have heard about this theory. It was very popular in the 1960s. And what it says is that presidential elections do matter. They do matter in the sense that American voters use them to force uh, seismic change, uh, to, to what are the paradigm shifts, to force paradigm shifts on American politics. And uh, I don't really have time to tell you what that theory is, so I'm going to allude to the theory, uh, the theory from, from time to time. Uh, you can ask me later uh, the intricacies of it. Uh, right now, I'm just going to start with the question of what's happened to the Republican Party? <laughs> All right. So uh, you perhaps have heard of the Republican establishment. I have to do this before the camera. Establishment. The Republican establishment uh, refers to the Reaganite core of the Republican Party, which was established in the critical election of 1980. Uh, the central tenet of the Reaganite core is that entrepreneurs should be free from government interference. For instance, the platform that Reagan had in 1980 was, quite simply put, cutting taxes, reducing government spending, rolling back regulations on businesses, and the fourth one, creating a professional, highly tech. Uh, military. So that was what he campaigned on. And uh, people who tried to explain this to the American people, if they had a positive view of it, uh, would say things like, uh, oh, prosperity will really aid the poor uh, because, uh, as they say, a rising tide lifts all boats. I know you heard that. If you want to describe it negatively, you could talk about trickle down economics. This main coalition, which was put together, this new political coalition, which, which was together in 1980, uh, really won three consecutive election, elections, uh, two with Reagan and one with Bush Sr. It was then the line of Republican candidates was broken with, uh, with Bill Clinton, as you probably know. But uh, Bill Clinton disavowed the Johnson-Kennedy uh, liberalism really, and adhered to a more moderate version, which he called uh, communitarianism. And if you looked at his elections, the, the reason he got elected the first time, I think James Carville, who had been here earlier, explained it right, it's the economy stupid. He, he was going to uh, jumpstart a stalled economy. The second time uh, he came back, he made a deal with Congress to reduce welfare spending uh, at both the federal and, and state uh, level. So the Reagan Center lost control over the Republican Party as a result of the next two terms by Bush Jr. Right? The next two terms ended up, um, I think, by frustrating the American people because of two wars, a fruitless and prolonged war in Afghanistan, a uh, unnecessary war in Iraq. Plus, on top of that, a grave financial crisis that what, unwound uh, the bankings, uh, banking firms, investment firms, and, uh, and home mortgages, plunged uh, uh, America, and, and some say an effect on, on the global economy as well. So the free enterprise center of the Republican Party <coughs> lost ground to a group within it, which I would call the social conservatives, the social conservatives. And the social conservatives are generally made up of white, church-going, middle-class uh, workers. And these people, although brought into uh, the Tea Party, they were brought into the Tea Party because of tax measures, they really branched out and began emphasizing social issues like abortion, uh, like uh, gun control, prayer in public schools, uh, illegal immigration, these became really important to them. And in Congress, we saw them led by people like uh, Michelle Bachmann, Mark Rubio, uh, Ted Cruz, right, familiar names from this campaign. They're all represented the Tea Party in, in Congress, the social conservatives within the Republican Party. So 
when the election began, uh, the center of the Republican establishment, the Reaganite center, uh, they started funneling money to Jeb Bush. The big million, you know, Bush piled up an enormous war chest uh, to go into it, but he could get no uh, traction at all. He was shunted aside by the Republican voters, which paved the way for the party insurgents like Mark Rubio and Ted Cruz uh, to come to the fore. Uh, they might have won had it not been for the spoiler. Who is the spoiler? Well, the spoiler is a non-political media celebrity, uh, a self-promoting uh, real estate tycoon, uh, Donald Trump, right, uh, who represents both populist and nationalist uh, movements in the United States. By populist, you can see the oratory, right? The oratory, he's honest, uh, he's aggressive, he's a little bit crude. Uh, there are people who are, you know, don't have a college education that really think Donald Trump is talking to them. They're talking because he's used the kind of language they use at home. And so that's his populist aspect. His nationalist aspect is that uh, he attacks, or he has been attacking, uh, these uh, outdated and uh, what we would call like selectively enforced immigration laws. Uh, he threatens to build a wall to keep out Hispanic immigrants, illegal immigrants. And he is stirring up fear uh, of a second 9-11 that some kind of Islamic fundamentalist act will come in, uh, not through the wall, but that will just fly in or, or, or come down from Canada. I, I'm not quite sure how they're getting here, but they'll be here. And uh, he's drawing upon economic discontent. Did you notice, although he's drawing upon economic discontent of the middle class, he really hasn't put forward any economic program to salvage the American economy or to get us back going again. Right now, he's just happily playing uh, these two chords, uh, his, his populist chord and his nationalist chord. Um, most curious about Trump, most curious about Trump is the fact that he has the ability to draw evangelicals away from the social conservatives, away from their Tea Party associates, uh, despite the fact that they're church the preachers have been telling them that you can't make a pact with the devil. Uh, they're, they're, they're still lining up uh, to go and see and vote uh, uh, for Trump. Speak of the devil, what the devil is going on with the Democratic Party? Well, we have our front leader now, uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, we know her as the long-suffering wife of philandering President Bill Clinton. Uh, this is a woman who, under the Clinton administration, led a probe into the possibility of universal health care. Uh, nothing ever came of that. Uh, she then, uh, once uh, uh, Bill had served his two terms, she then ran and became a popular New York senator. Um, in 2008, she declared herself a presidential candidate, but was eclipsed by uh, Barack Obama. Uh, Barack Obama did the generous thing, though. He turned around in a kind of team of rivals fashion and asked her to join his administration as Secretary of State. So one of the important things about Clinton, Hillary Clinton, you need to know, is that she has a political experience both in Congress and in the executive. Uh, she plays that out, you know, how much political experience I have, uh, whereas Donald Trump, he has no political experience whatsoever. So this is this would be this would be interesting to see where this goes. Second, um, she presents herself as a pragmatist. If you look at her history, she started out her political life, uh, you know, when she, when she met Bill as a Goldwater girl, as a supporter of the arch conservative Barry Goldwater, and uh, she followed uh, uh, Bill uh, through his. Um, Conversations through his his meandering uh, from uh, liberalism to communitarianism, she followed him, and so uh, she she's no radical liberal. 
She's no raging feminist. Uh, she sees herself, like her husband, as kind of a, a weather vane. She's a dependable weather vane. Um, she's also, you have to consider this too, she's the ripe fruit of the women's movement of the 1970s. Uh, this may play very well for her, particularly since Trump doesn't seem to understand women in the United States. 75% of the American women don't think that he is trustworthy. Okay, so uh, the last thing you need to know is that Clinton has been a steady endorser of Barack Obama's policies from 2008 on. She's endorsed his policies both domestically and, and foreign policy. So if she wins this election, this will be the third election, she will be a validating election, and we will have to start calling 2008 a critical election. We will have to call it a critical election. Now, of course, Clinton is challenged from within. Um, for eight years under Barack Obama, the economy has not really rebounded seriously. Recovery is slow, recovery is dicey. Uh, the middle class is depleted. Um, so you have a guy from the left who has a very simple solution. Attack the money interests. So what are the money interests? Well, first of all, big banking. And what uh, Bernie Sanders wants to do is to require more government regulation of banking, break up the mega banks, break up and disperse financial power. Secondly, cut the ties between money and politics. Cut the ties between money. He sees that uh, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court has damaged the McCain-Feingold Act with Citizen Union, uh, and what he wants to do is he wants to restore control over contributions to campaigns, and also, if he can, stop lobbying. He wants to, to, to roll back the lobbying. The final thing he's for is for attacking the super rich. Who are the super rich? The 1%. They call them the 1%. Um, and uh, he wants to put very high progressive taxes on them, maybe as high as 100% on the super rich. This is very similar to what happened in 1972. In 1972, George McGovern came out of nowhere to capture the Democratic nomination, and he did so on an anti-corporationist policy. He was going to tax corporations at 100% of their profit. He was going to change the way the country was run. Uh, Bernie Sanders refers to himself as democratic socialism. He's a democratic socialist. I think what that means is that he kind of likes a lot of things that the Scandinavian countries are, are doing. It's not that he really wants to become the next Pol Pot or uh, anything of that order, although I suppose some people on the far right think so. Uh, Dr. Remnell will speak next. Over the initial election year, the challenge from the left by Senator Sanders has completely undermined her capability to present herself again as the inevitable candidate. And this was the same crisis that she faced unexpectedly in 2008 when Senator Obama, uh, Obama challenged her from the left again and criticized her foreign policy credentials that had led her to support, according to me rightly, the first, the second Gulf War against Iraq. But that became a major contention in the Democratic Party that supported Obama's contention they were going to pull out of Iraq as a vote of no confidence against Bush. Julian, while staying in Afghanistan for a little while, since then, Hillary has changed her position, embraced uh, Obama's policies. She had become, after losing the election in 2008, the Secretary of State for the first four years. And therefore, she has to adapt to Obama's strategy. Therefore, everybody understood that her position against Obama in 2016 were just tactical issues. But being attacked by Sanders, who's further to the left than Obama, uh, she's been forced by Sanders to move further to the left and change her position. And because Sanders had mounted an unexpectedly very good challenge, she has been forced to all of a sudden, during the Carolina primaries, embrace Obama as if she's the daughter of Obama. 
to get the black vote throughout the South to fully accept what they already knew that she is the most eloquent supporter of the African American and Latino vote as well as general democratic vote. But she's been moving to the left in accepting this position. This has been evident in a clash that she had with Sanders where in her foreign policy credentials that she has presented and she supports the basic policy, support NATO, support a strong, a strong, not confrontation, but contentious relation with Russia, where you're going to try to contain Russia and not look at Russia as a friend, but be very firm because Putin has undermined us in the past. Support the war on terrorism. Do things that Obama has done until now, but be better and faster with more conviction. All of this, plus her trademark women role in the world that she has promoted while being at stake, has been completely undermined by Sanders, who, without having a foreign policy background, has immediately hit on the weakness of Hillary. Hillary, to show in her live audience that she really is a moderate candidate, and she embraced from both sides, did say that one of her mentors was Henry Kissinger, who I consider a great statesman, although he was a Republican. And she, as a Democrat, <laughs> who completely opposed everything the Republicans had done by looking at Kissinger as the main architect of foreign policy and retired expert of foreign policy, by showing that he also supports her viewpoint. Instead of giving her strength, Sanders said right away, I'm totally against Henry Kissinger for everything is done against American interest in Cambodia and everything else. And yet brought all things that the young generation that fall in do not remember there of the 70s of the Democrats opposing the war in Vietnam and opposing Nixon and Kissinger intervention in Cambodia as well as the support of the coup d'etat in Chile against um, Allende, democratically elected Allende. This fits into the discussion of Sanders as criticism of Hitler, that we cannot support changes in government that can lead to regime change if we don't know where we're going, because if you destroy a dictator in the name of regime change, like was done for Gaddafi and was being tried with Assad, has been done before also with Saddam Hussein in Iraq, you can open the door to chaos if the United States is not willing to intervene. And Sanders himself is not willing to intervene. Where they agree, and this is a major undermining for Hillary, where they agree is supporting refugees from uh, uh, Syria to come to America, which is a position that the, United States, uh, that the Republicans could be opposed. Where they agree is that there should be no wall to oppose uh, immigration from Mexico, but they both don't talk about illegal immigrants, where there are 11 million to 20 million illegal immigrants from Mexico, from other places, that come here while Ronald Reagan had promised in 1986 when he provided amnesty for six million illegal Mexican immigrants and made them citizens that this would never happen again. That is why you hear Trump coming out with his inanities about building the wall because that was the exact same discussion done during the Reagan administration, that the only way to stop him is building the wall. But Reagan, what Fowler said, was not the North American Free Trade Association, that by building on cooperating with the PRE, the uh, Institutional Re uh, Revolutionary Party that rules Mexico, to build the Maquilladora uh, factories in border towns where they would streamline the majority of immigrants and stop them coming to America, but work as sweatshirt labor at the border, they could then export work and jobs to the United States. But in the end, Mexico has had so much unemployment, so much crime laws, so much immigration, that the whole debate is a Trump card for Trump in going to the top of the and saying, what are you suffering? Hillary's victim also of being, like we said, the long-suffering wife of Bill, a great president that I consider extremely important, but that the Republicans hate because he trumped all family values by having a series of laws, like many men do, not me, not other responsible people. <laughs> you have to understand, in our discussion of foreign policy, we must understand that the American public opinion is very critical. This is a country where 50% of people are divorced. 
And this is a country where routinely tries to eliminate presidential candidates who have lovers, who have divorced spouses, or were separated, until this stuff has been falling on its face in the last two or three elections. So we have an hypocritical situation pushed by the media as well that opens this door that unless you're perfect and no is perfect, you cannot candidate yourself. Trump has eliminated this stuff to a degree because he is a second or third uh, manager. Uh, most importantly, before him, Bill has eliminated the whole thing because he was already discovered to have had at least two lovers uh, in the history during his special campaign when he won that he succeeded in surviving an impeachment that was not only to the sexual morals, it was going to be an inexistent uh, financial scandal that led to the sexual morale as well. Within that context, following values of the past that the families have rejected since after the second divorce, probably, of uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, who were sad with many of these scandals, but were actors. Okay? In the problem is that today, the people who support Sanders, who is a very old gentleman and very faithful to his wife, and has a lot of many people support him, and they don't think about history, they look at themselves as women not bound by gender to absolutely support Hillary as a unique representative of womanhood and the first female president of the United States. Because they don't feel that Hillary represents necessarily their idea of what women should be today and what women have accomplished through time, although they see her as a historical figure. While Hillary campaigns that she is a historical figure that should deserve to be the president. Within this combination, paradoxically, both Republicans and Democrats are accusing her of having betrayed feminists by not sending to hell Bill in the first place after being betrayed by him several times. We know why, because she and Bill are a couple politically and she's going to take the place of Bill. This was worked out a long time in the past. Cruz, and just a couple of things about Cruz and Trump. Trump represents in foreign policy a complete lack of knowledge, but he is able to speak to Bill we have to remember the majority of people come from the places in America that we don't see where they understand nothing about foreign policy. And therefore, he's able to speak to them and demystify all of the most important myths and areas of support in foreign policy. People support him. The fact that he says he's against NATO, because NATO, the most important alliance in history, that America supported, every president supported, except Obama recently was ended up supporting the EU, is not efficient according to, to Trump. It's ridiculous. It, all, everything about anti-terrorism is done by NATO, not the EU. That's a big problem. By supporting the EU, you undermine American intelligence and NATO. Well, you cannot go to war with Russia. What do you want? You cannot go and send combat troops of NATO in Syria against Assad, except because the leader of NATO is America, and America under Obama has refused to send combat troops down there. Therefore, it's not the issue of NATO. It's the issue of who has political will. And in NATO, everybody follows America. We do not want to send combat troops anymore after Iraq and Afghanistan. What do you do? So it's easy for Trump and it's easy for Cruz to criticize Obama and Hillary because they don't have a clear idea where they're going. What they distinguishes them, who is more to the right of supporting Israel. Cruz thinks he can because of religious support. Oh, uh, Trump has been able to demystify the opposition of the Jewish lobby by presenting himself and saying he's going to support them. What are key points? Where the embassy is going to be? The United States point has been the embassy never leaves Tel Aviv. Both of its Republicans, if they win, are going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, where the Israelis have always asked. What about the Syrians? They're terrorist supporters. But Trump started wrong because he's going to be in between both sides and figure it out. Most of the time, he does not know what he says. But the people agree that he has a fresh view. So, um, we're going to talk about media uh, and the role that the media has played in where we are right now. First thing we have to think about is what the media environment is in the United States. Uh, when you think about the media, you think about kind of two different strands. On the one hand, you have traditional media, which includes television, uh, radio, print, 
that's what we were, we're going to refer to as traditional media. On the other hand, you have social media. I think pretty much everyone on there. They're very different, but um, in this campaign, in this 2016 campaign, they've been used very effectively um, by a couple of the candidates and probably one candidate in particular. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the traditional media environment. Now, unlike in many other countries, um, the share of the audience from public broadcasting in the United States is very low. Okay, how many of you guys watch PBS? <laughs> yeah, now that Downton Abbey is done, right? okay. not many people are watching. Uh, not very popular. Okay. But if we lived in the United Kingdom, uh, what's the most popular broadcaster there? CBC, right? which is a public broadcaster. That means they're subsidized and they have to follow uh, you know, a set of rules lay forth in how they cover stuff, how much time they give to candidates. It's a different media environment okay, than we have in the United States. Does the government subsidize or own NBC or ABC or CBS? Not really, no. So our system of the press is motivated by profit. profit. You don't get money from the government to tell stories and to cover candidates. You have to get eyeballs on the sets. Okay? And then you can sell advertising, make a lot of money. That is what drives media in the United States. Now, how has business been for traditional media lately? Do you guys have like, you know, people who are like, oh yeah, so-and-so is a journalism major. They have like so many great job offers. <laughs> and believe me, my sister's a journalism major. She has a job, so she's great. But traditional media has struggled. Okay? Print media, newspapers. Much fewer people are reading newspapers than, than used to read them, and there are fewer newspapers to go around. Network news ratings have plummeted over time. Okay? Fewer and fewer people are watching network news. Uh, even cable TV ratings, not great for cable news. So business isn't going well. But on the other hand, it's kind of like you know, Star Wars A New Hope. 2016 is a new hope for traditional media. Okay. The campaign has almost single-handedly revived and, and kept media prosperous. Okay. If you look at this chart, you'll see these are presidential primary debate viewerships from 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2000, uh, 2012, 2016. Look at how much higher the ratings were for debates in 2016. Okay. 24 million people watched that first Republican debate. And even though the ratings have declined a little bit, you know, when you get to like the, the 10th episode, uh, they're still pretty high. Okay. That's a lot higher than what we have seen in the past. I mean, it's even as high as stuff like, you know, um, CSI or something. NCIS, whatever shows you guys like to watch, I don't know. Okay. It's very hot. Leslie Lubis is a uh, CB, CBS executive chair. What does he say about Donald Trump and ratings? Well, may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. Okay. If you're a media executive, if you work in the media, do you care about what's happening in the country, or do you care about, like, will I have a job tomorrow? But what is a more proximate concern for you? Probably having a job, or getting a second house, or I don't know what people do. And Leslie Lou Best, I'm assuming, has many houses. He's a rich guy. But what do you think is driving those high debate ratings? Not um, Jeb Bush. Right? It wasn't. Uh, you know, Marco Rubio clearly, unfortunately, right? It wasn't John Kasich, sorry. Okay, no one was tuning in to see what new seventh grade haircut he had. But, sorry, I don't understand. So, they wanted to see Donald Trump, okay? Donald Trump gets tons of coverage. He is 
the savior of the news media in this respect. Uh, for example, we, always, we often talk about how much money it takes to run a presidential campaign. Oh man, Citizens United, and Bernie Sanders says it's the corporate interest, oh, it's running everything. This chart shows how much media, and you can, you can chart how much media costs. Okay? If you get a hit on a TV show, that has a monetary value. If you buy an ad, that has a monetary value. Jack Bush spent $82 million on his campaign, but he only got about $214 million in free media. Donald Trump spent $10 million, has spent $10 million on his campaign, but he's earned almost $2 billion in free media. That's free. That's the media covering you just because they have nothing better to do. They have to fill a 24-hour news cycle, or your news is the most interesting. If you watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox News, they show more of the blank podium before Trump goes on to the stage to give his speeches than they do of the other candidates giving their speeches. When Trump gives a, a, a speech at the end of a primary night and other candidates give their speeches, they don't cut away to the other speeches. They keep it on Trump the entire time. He earns media. How does he earn media? Crazy statements. Okay? okay. When you do crazy stuff, people follow you. People would rather watch that than talk about policies. No one wants to hear Jeb Bush talk about why we need to be friends with the Muslim world. That's too complex. That's crazy, right? They're like, you know what we should do? Keep people out. Let's make a brash promise. Let's do something. That's something I can follow. Let's make fun of uh, so-and-so's family. I can follow that. That's easy. That's just like Jerry Springer. Right? That's easy. People like watching conflict. No one wants to hear reason debate, and clearly Donald Trump's not offering reason debate. So this shows you a chart of how many followers on both Facebook and Twitter the candidates have. And this was early in February, so there's a lot more now. As you can see, Donald Trump has more Twitter followers than any candidate and more Facebook followers than any candidate. That means any messages he uses on social media are going to reach more people than any other candidates. And once again, that's free media. Uh, if you look at uh, YouTube and Instagram, right? Bernie Sanders has a ton. So the other expert you can post on their phone, Bernie Sanders has a very good social media campaign. Okay? He has tons of YouTube followers. Uh, you know, Trump, not as many Instagram followers as Trump. Snapchat accounts. I don't, I don't mess around with this, but who follows any of these candidates on Snapchat? Emily, what do they put on Snapchat? Um, I follow Clinton and Kasich. Um, they both kind of do the same thing. Like, a lot of it is, like, talking to supporters. Kasich's, like, his daughters have, like, filmed, like, videos of them, like, talking about their dad. Don't and you send and them snaps back? I have sent them, yeah, John Kasich like added me back on Snapchat when I added him. I was like, I just added him to follow it and he added me back. So I send them to him, he opens them. Or whoever runs it opens them. <laughs> so I just send him anything and he opens it. Um, That's right. But see, you know, <laughs> I would be interested to see what Donald Trump's Snapchat is, but who knows. Um, another form of social media, this is Reddit. Anyone on Reddit? Yeah. Okay. Bernie Sanders is the king of Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even a little surprising. Um, now, Reddit has a very young, very male demographic. And Bernie Sanders is very good with that young, liberal male demographic. Uh, but as you can see, both of the insurgent kind of candidates, okay. Trump and Sanders, have strong social media followers. Okay? And so that helps them overcome the disadvantages they have among traditional media, more established media. The final thing to think about oh. is, unfortunately, I didn't want to put this up there, but Donald Trump has been, of all the candidates, the best candidate at merging his social media and traditional media strategy. When he does something on social media, when he retweets a quote from Mussolini, right, which was a classic, uh, when, he, when he retweets someone of his followers who sends him a picture like this. It becomes news itself on traditional media, which then gives him more earned media. 
So not only does he reach the 6 million people on Twitter or 7 million people on Twitter, he then gets an entire 24-hour news cycle talking about what he retweeted, mm -hmm. just from one click of a button. Okay. His social media activity becomes traditional media activity, more so than any other candidate. This obviously has to do with um, the situation with uh, his wife and Ted Cruz's wife, um, where he feels that a group associated with Ted Cruz attacked Melania, his wife. Um, I can't show that picture. <laughs> okay. That would be inappropriate. Uh, but someone retweeted this picture, an unflattering picture of Ted Cruz's wife, or sent it to Trump, and Trump retweeted it, which has led Ted Cruz to attack. But the whole thing leads to more coverage of Trump, more free media. Okay? So when you think about it, the final thought, even though Donald Trump, for the reasons you guys mentioned, probably will not ultimately win the White House in 2020, in 2018, and in the non-presidential elections, people are going to try to copy his media strategy. Now, will they be able to do it with the same effect as him? I don't know. He's got 20 years of experience in reality TV that's helped him. But uh, for sure, politics are going to become more like what Trump has run than what you know candidates in the 19th century are. Tell me what you think of, the, uh, of this presentation. Um, do you have some comments, maybe? Or some criticism. Okay, Dr. Morelli, you were talking about um, like the morality and like the traditional marriage and saying that like Bill Clinton kind of shattered that. And I kind of disagree with you because people don't talk about like Trump's immorality, but they still in Hillary's campaign bring up um, like her marriage and everything, but they don't particularly do that with other people. Do you think that part of that is um, sexist that they're treating her differently, they're bringing up her marriage because she's a woman and marriage tends to be reflected more upon the woman? No. Let's, let's think about this in a certain way. It is a political campaign to destroy Hillary, to use her loyalty to the structure of marriage and stay married. Well, basically, I'm sure they have two separate beds, two separate houses. <laughs> you understand? So they're perfectly autonomous. But that has been the norm throughout history of the 1800s, 1900s, of many married couples who never divorced but lived together in completely separate rooms while maintaining the facade of marriage. The facade of marriage as an institution which is valid and in political science considered essential for a presidential campaign or a senator to run has been a cornerstone of the Republicans. In this case, the Republicans, in this case Trump, are using it to undermine Hillary, not as a sexist issue, but as something they can use to destroy her. It's not against all women, it's against this disconnect between feminists of the past, traditional women, feminists of today, that do not see supporting a husband who is in, a, a disloyal an issue that's going to be a break or not. I think that Trump very likely put it there as a way to discuss about it. The thing about Bill and Hillary, we need to understand that Bill was the first president elected while he was already running that had lovers revealed. We know by history how many presidents after they were elected developed lovers. I even know, and I don't remember if it was Garfield, who had already experimented in the pant pantry closet in the White House where Bill and Monica never had any relation. You understand? <laughs> so, according to Bill. But the issue is political. And in the political issue, the issue is, if you are a president, you can be undermined. But they started doing that after Kennedy was no longer president. Kennedy, the most important philanderer. But nobody in the media ever covered it because he was a great president, he was very handsome, and it was an issue in the media we never cover the personal privacy. With Watergate, everything is open. And they never found anything about Nixon and his wife. But 
Everybody else had Picadillos. In the case of Hillary, the case of Trump, this is the first time, and not even Trump. Let's go before the previous election when we had uh, Giuliani. Giuliani was the first multiply divorced Republican candidate going ha with a hand open to the religious right saying he would be a great president. And people stopped in the Republican talking about him being the opposite of what they had campaigned for 30 years as a symbol of, uh, of uh, moral values. Reagan was married to his second wife. Nobody discussed about him and Nancy because they're the symbol of those cultural campaigns. So the point is, when I make a decision between you're divorced or you're unfaithful, etc., and I think that that discussion exploded with Gary Hart that was separated by his wife but had to run fishery with his wife who was found with photographs with his lover, uh, Donna Rice, next to the boulder going on vacation called Monkey Business. And he was, and, and that destroyed him. And at the same time, I lived in Washington, the famous mayor of Washington, uh, Barry, known for his sexual peccadillos, but black, and a revolutionary black that had the support of the ghettos of Washington had in the same situation. What was the difference? Gary Hart went down in flames. The leader of the foreign policy of the Democratic campaign was finished, finished, because he never fought it. Barry, all the time he spoke about what he did to bring jobs, education to the poor blacks in the inner city of Washington, D.C., and never took an answer of how many women he went to bed. And he got reelected until he finally caught him, he snorted the cocaine, and he went down. But you understand, this is a political issue. And so that's what I say. On the other hand, um, I don't know. I think that Trump has succeeded in completely changing the rules. And nobody's able to understand how much this is a Trump phenomenon or people have finally come to age and realize by now that both parties are very, very hypocritical in many things. And they just want to go beyond. And that is destructive for both parties who are comfortable in a certain language of accusation and virtue. Do you think it says not only for the Republican Party now, but for the future of the Republican Party, that they are so like set in this new version, most of them are so set in this new version of the Republican Party that is so based around extremism that they cannot get behind a candidate like Kasich? Like, what do you think it says about, that? I'm not saying that, I know that they, they probably are far enough to realize that Kasich is too weak of a candidate, but do you think that they, if they got behind him, if most of the establishment got behind him, rather than splitting right now between Trump and Cruz, that he could have a solid chance at being nominee over Trump? Well, generally what happens in American politics is after a majority establishes its hold and, and gives us a reigning ideology, the minority party, or what's left, the remnants of the former majority, they get together and they try to copy the winning combination. Uh, for instance, in the last election, uh, you had um, someone who very much like Obama. You had a, a, a someone who is from a, a, a despised minority, uh, namely the Mormon Church, uh, who had, as governor of Massachusetts, uh, put forward a health care program that reached down to uh, to the poor, uh, you had you know him running on a, a basically uh, being quiet about other aspects of, of, of Reaganomics running, and so what I think will happen, depending on who wins this election, the Republican Party will reform itself. If the Republican Party should win, and if they should win with uh, Donald Trump, that might be a major shift in America. We just have to watch what happens. One thing both uh, parties will probably do at this convention is they, at each convention, they have meetings uh, where groups go in and they uh, decide what's going to be done during the next primaries. Well, the fact that Donald Trump got sprung on the Republican Party is probably going to make both parties rethink how they hold primaries. And we may see the formation of more, more superdelegates uh, available in, in, in both parties which guarantees that the activists within the party are not outsiders. 
will be able to determine the event. Well, if the Republicans had superdelegates, it would, like the Democrats do, it'd be a lot easier to stop Donald Trump. A large number, they have a small number. Yeah. A uh, large number. But if they had the 400 and some delegates exactly. that the Democrats had, it'd That's be very problem. easy to keep him from 1237 or, you know, keep him from a majority. They, they made these rules so it would be easier for Jeb Bush to win. <laughs> or someone like Jeb Bush. Poor Jeb. And did not work out. Uh, that's why they have winner take all. Because they thought, oh, we'll get it out of the way. And, you know, the establishment candidates will win these northern states that are more establishment states, winner take all, we'll be fine, right? Well, now, if they had the Democratic rules were proportional, well, if you had three or four candidates, you could easily keep Donald Trump from getting a majority if everything was proportional. But it's too tough now because they made the rules to help Jeff. Uh, I would like to add something to both of you, and I slightly disagree with both of you. I agree with what you're saying. I slightly disagree on the issue that Donald Trump is, the revolution that the party has not been able to deal with. Because they saw Sanders as an equal revolution. Sanders and Obama before were able to mount an insurgency campaign from the left and reach a point that they were so undermining Hillary that many of the super delegates of Hillary then moved to Sanders. That's what his campaign is now. And if he keeps winning, he will not win, but he keeps winning a large percentage, it becomes inevitable that either the parties unite against Trump, that means he has to be offered the vice presidency, or enough people will shift, especially if he gets to 50-50. For Trump, the problem of the Republican Party is Trump is one of four to five Tea Party activists that ran in the presidential campaign. And he's a Tea Party representative that is leading. But the same was Cruz, the same was Rubio, and the same was, was um, um, Rand Paul. And the Tea Party emerged as an opposition from grassroots against the party in the previous election. And we thought they were dead, and they came back, and they came out of the entire media based on the line, uh, line ball, not line ball, that's, that's wrong, uh, um, uh, all the ultra right wing uh, media talk show and um, uh, Rush Limbaugh, Rush Limbaugh. So, uh, Rush Limbaugh and others who over the last 20 years have cultivated an angry right wing rejectionist opinion among many grassroots Republicans that goes not necessary but can even go against the establishment and now it has exploded as its own grassroots political force at Tea Party. And Trump has been the most able of this Tea Party by even getting something to support him, not Cruz, not the others, to go and take that mantle, tagging them both together. And so we should not discount this as a generational revolution in parties, just like Bernie is bringing out of left field the generational revolution of the Democratic Party towards socialism. And I keep telling my students, look, I don't agree with socialism, although I used to be socialist in Europe, but in the Democratic Party, you look at Democrats from New England, California, and, and New York, they are socialists. That's not the Democratic Party, but they're pushing the party to the left. Now, Bernie is able to motivate so many people that this push, started by Obama officially, is becoming an issue of how we can change it. Before Obama was, was the other guy from, 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 from Connecticut. So, uh, so we have this in both parties. Are they able to reform themselves by taking this new change, or will they split? That is the issue. So the, uh, sorry. Can I add just one, yeah, done, one thing? what you're saying, I agree, the part about talk radio and all yeah. this. When you are in a party and you hear from people that you respect and you listen to that the establishment is selling you out, John Boehner is selling you out, yeah. Mitch McConnell is selling you out, Paul, they're all selling you out, Mitt Romney, then that term, anyone who runs against the establishment is going to take advantage of that. There's been some talk about maybe an establishment Republican running an independent campaign. And uh, last week, a poll came out uh, showing a three-way race between uh, Libertarian candidate Gary Johnson, Trump, and Clinton, where Johnson got 11% polling from both Democrats and Republicans. Do any of you believe that a, you could see a sizable either third party or independent challenge this race, considering a third of the Republicans won't vote for Trump, and many Bernie Sanders may find themselves disaffected? Uh, 
with the equipment that's there around me. Yeah, I think I think so. I think that it's pretty likely. Um, there might be an establishment Republican that runs, um, or this might be the libertarian moment, Mark. This might be the moment you've been waiting for. Do you think like, things could get so messy that we see a shift in American politics away from a two-party system? Mm -hmm. Like this could be, like, say Hillary gets the nomination and say the Republicans do a brokered convention because they don't want Trump and his supporters freak out and go for the write-in, and we have four people showing up at the polls in the general. Do you think that could lead to a split? In the short term, but I think in the long term, the equilibrium will go back to two parties. Okay. It might reshuffle. Think about in 1860, uh, 1856 and 1860 with the emergence of the Republicans, right? It reshuffled the deck, but then it led to the two party system we had for a very long time. So I think something like that could change the parties. It might even change the names of some of the parties. But I think because of our first past the post voting, our, you know, we will end up with a two party system. Um, before that, in 1913, the Republican Party split between Taft and the previous president, Teddy Roosevelt, who created an extra Republican Party, the Moose. Uh, Bull Moose. Yeah, Bull Moose. And that allowed Wilson and the Democrats to win with a minority. Uh, so, yes, I, but I agree with what you're saying. Fundamentally, it is the electoral system with the single college uninominal system that favors the consolidation of power into parties over the long run. And in fact, in World War I, Theodore Roosevelt became, by re-embracing the Republican Party, the only Republican candidate until he died of a heart attack, and that led to Lincoln Poop's Republicans becoming presidents in the 20s. For what concerns independence, I disagree with uh, my colleagues, because I think the example of Rand Paul who is the libertarian that became Tea Party Republican, and his father that brought the libertarians in the Republican Party, okay, has proven that they did not have enough wings to emerge, either within the party as a major candidate or autonomous. And on the left, you have the Democrats, you have Biden. All the story about Biden running against Hillary petered out because Biden and everybody else do not have the time to raise the money and the organization to mount a major campaign. Uh, although, technically, a broker convention can bring people from the side. The last credible candidate that could come, Bloomberg. And even Bloomberg had to concede he does not have the time to build this structure. Bloomberg is a perfect candidate that both Democrats and Republicans would vote and has experience. And yet, it's too late, too late, too late. I was going to say, like, I know like, the uninominal system eventually leads to the, the you know, two parties and it's a split, but what does it really like say about the system that we have so much in the last like, 25, 30 years, so much anti-establishment movement all the way from like, Pat Buchanan as like um, a paleo conservative up until now when you've got Trump and Bernie and everything in between, you know, you've got like Rand Paul, Ron Paul, you have the whole Tea Party movement in there, and then, you know, 2000, you've got that whole mess. But, you know, in the last 25, 30 years, we've had so much more anti establishment movement. What does that really say about like the uninominal system and where that's going to eventually lead us? The same era that Barbara was talking about earlier in the early 20th century, there was a progressive party. There was Bull Moose Party. There, there, there was these these different groups. There have always been popular Brian and the yeah. But like yeah. in our modern society Populous. going to only increase that with like social media and more people like effectively yeah. forming their opinions on the outside of the two parties. Perhaps, but if parties are efficient and parties want to win, they will include those popular ideas that people like that are currently outside of their platform and bring them into their So we're going to have like less polarized parties and are they going Perhaps. to become more moderate? Perhaps. The Constitution contains yeah. a very clever device that ensures that we will have something like a two-party system and that is the Electoral College. To win in the Electoral College you have to have a majority of the votes and the majority of the votes are located in big states which are scattered across the country and so anyone who looks at the Electoral College, says what I have to do is I have to find something that appeals to a majority of voters in a number of these large states. I have to get Which is uh, why Florida is such a hot state for appeals, because like New York and California are always going to be blue, and like Texas, which is one of like the biggest states, is always going to be Republican. 
So that's why like Florida is such like a big appeal city, same with Ohio. But like, what does that really like say about where we're going to end up in like a hundred years? Well, like, that means our, that the two parties normally will have the same views. There'll be very little difference between them, and they'll be appealing to the same part of the electorate. And so the the parties, it'll be very difficult to tell which which party is which party is, is, is which. And that's a result of the way the Electoral College runs. We aren't like uh, these s uh, other kind of smaller countries that have uh, parliaments and don't have a, a federal system. So we're not going to have, we're not going to have what Honduras has. Ha I just came back. Honduras <laughs> has you really a were looking whole bunch, <laughs> yes, I was. There's a whole bunch of um, uh, parties there, right? And the guy who won the presidency, um, he was a, a, a radio comedian, Do they have and he just kind of threw his hat in the ring because he was running out of jokes, and he got elected president. So and now they have a clown for president. Do they have proportional representation, or are they unanominal? I think that, I don't know what Hunter says, but I think what Hud's saying, they don't have a presidential system either. They have a parliamentary, parliamentary system. system. Yeah, but, but, but that is immaterial. In all majority of countries, in the Constitution is a provision that deals with how the elections are going to be run. And you, that means that most countries have it as either uninominal, like in America, or proportional, which is popular vote. That means that even if in America the popular vote gives one candidate a vote, it ends up that the proportional is eliminated by what the Constitution says. You cannot change a Constitution unless you have 70% of the votes in the Parliament that uh, prevents this change. This has been the great drama of changing electioneering in Italy and the great drama changing it in France. We have that complete constitution. Currently, you have the uninominal in the Fifth Republic. And, and, and even when the socialists won in the Mitterrand and changed the constitution by making it proportional, then the conservatives won and re changed the constitution. In America, it's the same thing. So that's why. You need to have enough people say we want to go to proportional vote, uh, but I don't see that happening it's gonna be because the party that wins the most is able to control most, and it's a big boost. Yeah. And it does help to have some familiarity with how other countries operate in order to understand why ours is is very different. Well, Canada has been trying also to move to a proportional system. Just a bit of a follow up. Uh, I mean, I agree that at the federal level you probably won't see a break with the two-party system, but could you possibly theoretically see down the road, especially if, with an election like this, maybe a couple more, or some of this, sort of a blow up of the two-party system. You see uh, third parties, maybe, that have a regional hold, maybe have someone of a presence in Congress, but ultimately, maybe have a split ticket or endorse one of the two major parties. Well, think about in Canada, once again. You have more than two parties, but really one of them is just a regional Quebecois party. Right um, now, they don't have as strong of a presidential system as we have, so there's less of an incentive to have national parties. When you have the electoral college and when you have a presidential system, if you want to win, you ha you have to have broad appeal throughout the country. And so, I agree with Grace with what you said, and Mark. Yeah, it could. There's nothing saying that the that the parties can't can't realign or things can't blow up, or you can't have four or five parties in one election. But over time, in equilibrium, the people that donate money to those campaigns, the people that vote, and the people that want to win election are going to coalesce around the two biggest rumps that are left because they want to win. Uh, it's a matter of, of, of regional parties, although we certainly have um, you know, Oh. Our regional differences. Well, think about the Democratic Party through the 1950s, and really from 1900 through 1960 or 1970. It really was the Southern Democratic Southern Democrats were a regional party, but they had to be linked with the rest of the Democratic Party in order to win. Right, they didn't run for the presidential candidate. Right, they would have been linked today if it weren't for LBJ right. deciding yeah. to break with them. But you, I mean, you know, a Democrat in New Franklin Roosevelt and uh, you know Richard Russell in Georgia, they did not have a lot in common in terms of <laughs> political beliefs, 
but they were in the same party, not because they were like, hey, let's, you know, this Proud is great, we're both Democrats, but out of necessity. And so you need broad parties if you want to win in the United States. And, you know. However, the parties have moved since of betrayed to become more into the Democrats more towards the center left, right. Republicans more towards the center right. right. You can have a short term third party, yeah. but the key example would be probably Ross Perot. That created an independentist force, but the mostly stole votes from the Republicans and supported by default the Democrats. So that leads that when you do the presidential campaign, are you going to work out a coalition, which has never been done in America? That means giving to Ross Perot, who replaces him in that kind of a winner make all third party force that cannot win, but can be the deal maker, the vice president. And at that point, you create what America never had, a coalition of two parties. Eventually, down the line, will they merge? Will they split? And if they remain, the coalition becomes issue. So the other party has to move them out. Join us, because you are the independents can be on one side or the other. And, 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 and that's it. But today, they're very polarized. The Tea Party is very polarized right wing, like the Republican Party has emerged over the last 15 years, very much to the right. So they are discussing about how far to the right they should go, not how far different are they. And in the Democratic Party, the amount of success that Sanders brings out of all of those areas that have become, for the last 20 years, socialists within the Democratic Party has shown that indeed it's a discussion between us. So they become currents within the party rather than separate parties. Okay, I'm going to pull rank here and, and bring it in to uh, <laughs> this. Uh, we'll do this again in the fall. It was so much fun. Yeah, uh, great. Thank you.